I'm going to start by introducing myself. Um, I work as a bioinformatician. I've been at OSCR for six years. I've done a lot of work uh, in the first three years. Uh, I worked in production, so we tested a lot of tools, bioinformatic tools, <coughs> and we assembled pipelines. We processed sequencing data, did alignments, uh, variant calling, uh, RNA-seq and DNA-seq, and then we pass uh, the uh, align file or variant calls to uh, people in the downstream analysis. Uh, right now, I'm focusing on doing a lot of biomarker uh, analysis, taking that downstream uh, data and then working with it to develop biomarkers. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, gene expression, uh, specifically RNA-seq. So I will give you a brief introduction about RNA sequencing, and, um, and then we'll go over uh, alignments. We'll talk about a couple of tools that we've picked for this module. Uh, we'll talk about QC visualizations, uh, and then uh, the last part will be expression, expression, differential expression. So the first three parts are going to be lectures. Uh, I, I'm hoping that in the first section of today's module, we'll just cover the lecture, and then the second section, I have a small data set, RNA-seq data set. Uh, we have raw sequences, and uh, we'll go through the alignment process and the uh, expression estimation together. So hopefully we'll have time to, uh, to do that. <laughs> Um, so, for the first section, uh, I will give you an introduction to the theory and practices of RNA-seq sequencing, um, rationale behind uh, sequencing the RNA, challenges that are specific to RNA-seq, uh, general goals and themes for RNA-seq analysis, workflows, and then uh, we'll finish this section by talking about technical, common technical questions related to RNA-seq analysis that uh, people usually mm -hmm. ask at the beginning of the project before they start working with RNA-seq. So when we're talking about gene expression, uh, I wanted to start with the uh, central dogma. Uh, it helps us uh, really connect genotype with phenotype. You're starting with uh, DNA sequences that are transcribed uh, in the nucleus to RNA sequences. Those RNA sequences are then uh, modified. You take out any regions in the uh, DNA or RNA that are not coding. Uh, these are called introns. And then you stitch all the coding regions together. Uh, these are uh, exons to uh, form mature mRNA. And then you take that mature uh, mRNA into the cytoplasm where you perform translation. You translate them into proteins, func functional uh, proteins. Um, and in order for us to understand what genes are turned on and off in the, in the cell at a specific time, and also understand the relationship between genes, uh, we need to uh, be able to quantify uh, the RNA in, this, in, in the cell. And we can do that by quantifying the mRNA fragments, for example, uh, in the cell. And RNA sequencing is one technology that will enable us to, to do that. So there are other technologies that you can use to do that, like microarrays. Uh, but currently, most of uh, gene expression analysis is being done using RNA sequencing. And we'll get, uh, uh, I'll give you more information about why RNA sequencing sequencing is very popular. Uh, you'll realize that in the, in the first section of this module. So uh, the, the basic idea behind RNA sequencing is that you're, you're, you have a sample of interest, whether you have like a treatment or a condition that you're trying to see how it affects the gene expression of the cell. Um, you extract the RNA from those samples. You uh, generate cDNA fragments. And you sequence those fragments using a sequencing platform. Uh, Illumina is a very popular uh, uh, platform. You generate reads that are usually around 100 uh, base pairs. And then uh, you go through the process of taking those reads and aligning them to uh, the, the genome or the transcriptome, and then trying to, and then you try to quantify the, uh, the reads. So why RNA? What does RNA have that uh, DNA doesn't have? So a lot of functional studies um, use RNA because um, the genome is actually constant, and the condition that you're trying to study in the experiment uh, affects the gene expression only, and it doesn't affect the, the DNA. So if you're looking at drugs, for example, uh, you want to see the drug uh, effect uh, um, uh, for treated versus untreated cell line. That would be a great way to uh, use RNA-seq. Uh, also, predicting as a transcriptome assembly from DNA is a very complicated procedure. And up until today, there are a lot uh, uh, of, of genes and, and isoforms that we're still discovering thanks to uh, our, uh, the technology of RNA sequencing. 
Um, and some features are actually only present at the RNA seq level, uh, or at the RNA level, sorry, not the DNA, such as alternate isoforms, uh, fusion transcripts, and RNA editing. Um, we can also use RNA to interpret mutations that do not have an obvious effect on uh, protein sequence. So uh, these would be the uh, re regulatory mutations uh, that will help us understand how uh, mRNA isoforms are expressed and how they're regulated. Uh, and finally, uh, if you have DNA data and, you, and you've called variants, for example, and you want to prioritize those variants that you've called from DNA, you can use RNA to help you uh, prioritize those uh, mutations, somatic mutations. So, uh, for example, if uh, the, the gene is not uh, expressed, but it's mutated, then you might not be as interested in, in that gene. Uh, if there is an uh, expression in the wild type uh, uh, of, the, of the mutation, then that could indicate there is a loss of function. Uh, but if there, the, mut the mutant allele is actually expressed, then that could be very interesting because that could be a potential a drug target. Um, with RNA comes uh, a lot of challenges uh, that you might actually see um, in other platforms like DNA-seq. Uh, but a lot of cha these challenges are actually unique to RNA-seq as well. So when we're talking about sample, uh, you have to worry about sample purity. You have to worry about the quantity. Do you have enough sample to perform RNA sequencing? Uh, the quality of the sample, is it good enough? Uh, can you move forward and, and sequence it? Um, also, the fact that RNA, and this is unique to RNA, the fact that it has small exons that are um, separated by very large uh, intronic uh, regions. So mapping is a difficulty uh, compared to uh, DNA-seq. Uh, also, the abundance of RNA varies a lot uh, between the genes and between samples as well. So um, that you, have to keep, you have to keep that in mind. Uh, also, the, uh, uh, because RNA-seq is based on random sampling, uh, you might get genes that are very highly expressed, and what they end up doing is they they um, they consume the majority of the reads. So you might actually have some bias uh, in that sense. Also, RNA uh, comes in different sizes. So you have micro RNAs, and those are uh, those could be as short as a few bases uh, long, and you will need special capturing uh, methods uh, for for those. So you have to figure out what you want out of your RNA seq uh, before you start uh, sequencing. And uh, finally. RNA, in general, is more fragile than DNA, so it deg degrades uh, easily. So that's another thing that you have to be careful uh, of and also check for before you perform uh, sequencing. So one method that you can use to perform the quality of your uh, RNA sample before you, uh, you start sequencing is uh, RIN. Um, how many people have heard of RIN before? OK. Um, so RIN is a score uh, between 0 and 10 that can help you uh, identify the quality. 10, uh, if you get a score of 10, that means it's a very the, the sample that you're dealing with is very, is very good quality. Uh, zero means it's very bad, means it's, it's degraded. So what does, what does that number mean and where does it come from? It's a technology by Agilent uh, where what you're doing pretty much is you're, uh, you're running your RNA through uh, gel electrophoresis. And uh, in that process, you're breaking uh, down the RNA and then a molecule, the RNA molecules will move according to their size. Now, RNA in general is uh, composed of 80% of the RNA in the cell is ribosomal RNA. So you only have very little um, mature RNA in, in the cell. So in this plot, uh, we, what you expect to see is you expect to see um, ribosomal RNA mainly, because it's, it's, uh, most of the RNAs are ribosomal. And ribosomal RNA consists of two subunits. So there is 18S and 28S. So the, the, if the sample is clean, then you will see two very clean peaks, uh, indicating that these are the two ribosomal uh, uh, subunits. And if the uh, sample is degraded and not in a, a good quality, then uh, you don't see those uh, clear peaks, and you see a lot of, uh, of fragments, uh, uh, which indicate that the RNA is degraded, and you're getting different uh, uh, fractions of uh, different sizes of RNA. So usually. People uh, would look at RIN first before they go ahead and do the sequencing, and different people have different thresholds. Um, people, um, uh, I think we, we used to have a RIN of, of seven or eight uh, as, a, as a cutoff, but it really depends on the samples that you have. If you have things that have a low RIN, like, let's say four or five, then maybe you can go back and ask for uh, more sample, better quality, uh, and if you can't, then um, 
keep that in mind when you're doing the sequencing that the quality of the sequences will not be as good as uh, a sample that has a high Lin number. Um, once you figure out the quality of your RNA, then uh, you have to pick the uh, capture method or the proto protocol that you can use to do library uh, prep. And there are so many different library prep techniques uh, out there that you can choose from. And it really depends on what you're interested in. What do you want to do? Uh, what kind of question you're trying to address or answer in your experiment? So once you isolate the RNA, you break it down, um, the pool of RNA that you're getting, as I said, is mainly ribosomal RNA. Uh, that is called total RNA. And then you have to ask yourself, okay, do I only need uh, uh, mRNA? If I'm only interested in the coding uh, region, then you will have to pick another uh, um, capturing method um, that will either be a selection or a depletion. So you can, with depletion, what you do is that you deplete or you get rid of the ribosomal content uh, in the total RNA. Uh, with a selection, you actually go and select for uh, the mRNA by doing a poly-A uh, selection or uh, a, a cDNA uh, capture. Um, so depending on what you want to do, you can uh, pick the uh, appropriate library technique. In addition to that, you also have to think about strandedness, um, whether you want uh, strand, uh, strand information, uh, because if you do, then you're going to have to pick a kit that will uh, uh, reserve or keep the strand information uh, in, the, in the library. So here we're looking at two examples. Uh, the first one is a library that is not stranded. And you will, uh, what, you, what you will see is that reads will, uh, you will not be able to tell whether the read is coming from uh, the leading strand or the lagging strand. Uh, while reads that are coming from a, a stranded library, uh, you will be able to uh, distinguish uh, if this gene is being transcribed on the leading strand or the lagging strand. Um, now, in hum why, why would you need that? Um, in humans, it might not be a big of an issue, but in other species it might. But you can, uh, you can have two genes in the uh, transcriptome that are overlapping. Um, uh, different degrees of uh, overlap. So one would be on the leading strand, one would be on the lagging strand. And if you don't look at the strand information, um, you will you might actually not count expression correctly because you might be taking reads from one strand and counting it for the other gene uh, that's being transcribed in the other strand. Um, but yeah, so that's that's useful. If you have any gene overlap in the gene irritation, then you you want the strand information. Yeah. So there's a reverse strand here. What is that? Sorry. I heard there is a reverse strand. Here. Reverse strand? Yeah. Well, the, the the DNA consists of two strands, right? So the transcription can happen on either of these uh, strands, uh, the leading strand or the or the lagging strand. Um, I don't know. Like, like, they want me to specify like it's one single strand or double strand or the reverse strand. Single strand, double strand, or reverse strand. Yeah, I'm not sure what uh, what that means. Maybe he's talking about the lagging strand. Okay. Yeah, I don't, yeah, it's leading or lagging. Like it would be one strand or the other. I'm not sure about the the, the reverse. Oh yeah, so that's yeah, so that's also so. When you're thinking of direction, you have to keep in mind that there are two points in sequencing where direction exists. So, uh, or the, the direction here I'm talking about is strandedness. So that's where the gene is being transcribed. Uh, there is also the uh, the forward and reverse. That's when you take the read and you sequence the read. When you sequence the read, you can actually sequence it from both sides. So these are two different things. Uh, they both involve direction, but one is biological and one is technical. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah. So I had a question about the ring. Um, you said it gives us an idea, it measures the quality of the ribosome. Um, but does that automatically, so if we have a sample which has ring 10, um, which, which means that the ribosome does it automatically need mRNA also? So it's it's not really the measuring the quality of the RNA. It's telling you um, how much uh, RNA there is compared to other, uh, uh, like it's it's the proportion of RNA to non RNA or RNA in the in the cell. This is 
this is no, this is uh, everything. Yeah, all the RNA, exactly. Yeah, not just the ribosomal RNA. And, and not here, no. But uh, it's just telling you because eighty percent of the cells are ribosomal RNA, so you you expect to see a certain proportion uh, uh, of ribosomal versus non-ribosomal. Um, and here, just the ribosome. Yeah, just the ribosomal. Yeah. So the two subunits of the ribosomal RNA. So, so my question is, how does it tell you anything about the quality of the mRNA? It's. I don't think it specifically tells you the quality of the mRNA. You just basically assume that if this is good, then the mRNA. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, you can. I mean, you can check the uh, the paper. They've done. I think they've done a lot of. Uh, uh, validation studies where they would uh, pick the REN number and then actually check the quality of the of the data after, and then they did a correlation of the REN with the the quality of the mRNA, and they probably uh, extrapolated that from from here. Okay. All right. So uh, find out the quality of the sample. We picked um, a capturing method. We figured out whether or not we want strand information. Uh, then you have to uh, think about replicates. Um, I know it's very difficult to get replicates in, uh, in sequencing because replicates cost money, but it's, uh, it's extremely uh, important to, uh, to have replicates, both technical replicates and bio biological replicates. And when I'm talking te technical replicates, I'm talking uh, uh, you, can, you can take the same sample and sequence it either on different lanes or different uh, uh, chips, different dates. Uh, with biological replicates, we're talking uh, the different samples that are going through the same condition uh, or under the same condition that you're trying to study. So try to go for at least three replicates. That will give you some meaningful uh, statistical summaries. Um, the, so three would be the, the minimum. Uh, once you uh, get these replicates, uh, downstream, uh, downstream, a lot of the tools that you're using in RNA-seq, uh, they do take the replicates in consideration when they're trying to calculate expression, differential expression. Uh, and uh, as a QC metric, before you do any of that, you can actually compare uh, the read coverage uh, between the replicates and just look at the correlation between uh, your replicates. <clears throat> so uh, some of the common analysis goals for RNA-seq uh, is to um, look at gene expression and differential expression, just like I mentioned. Uh, you can also look at alternative, uh, alternate expression analysis. Uh, you can try and do some transcript discovery and uh, annotation. Uh, you can do alle allele-specific expression, uh, especially if you have uh, stranded uh, information. If you don't have stranded information, that will be uh, difficult. Uh, you can also do mutation uh, calling, mutation discovery on RNA-seq, uh, and uh, fusion de detection and RNA editing. So there's a lot of stuff that you can get out of your uh, RNA-seq RNA uh, data. Um, and and uh, uh, these things, uh, you don't have to worry about, uh, like you can use the same library uh, prep protocol. So you don't have to change the library prep protocol to, uh, to, to get that data. You can use the same protocol, and uh, once you get the sequencing data, you can uh, get all of this uh, from, from there. Um, so the, the, the way it works is that you, se so you, se you, se you sequence the, uh, the sample, you get uh, reads, raw reads that come in uh, FASTQ uh, format. Uh, at this point, you're probably used to uh, file names. Uh, by the end of the week, you probably have seen uh, uh, similar file, file, uh, file names in DNA-seq. Um, so you get the FASTQ files, you align the FASTQ files to get aligned reads. Then you take the aligned reads, you do some sort of transcript assembly, you, uh, you try to uh, uh, assemble transcripts for the different samples uh, that you have. Then you try to quantify uh, the number of reads for each one of the transcripts that you assembled, that's expression estimation, and then you try to compare uh, the, the samples that you have, the conditions, the genes, uh, to find uh, uh, genes uh, that are differentially expressed between different samples. Um, and then finally, you do some uh, sort of summarization, heat map. Uh, so that's pretty much the uh, workflow that a lot of gene expression pipelines uh, follow. Now, the tools can be different, but the idea behind it is, is pretty much the, the same. All right, so common questions that you should uh, ask uh, the, uh, yourself when you're starting any RNA-seq project. Um, first one is, should I remove duplicates for RNA-seq? So, 
Um, do you guys know what uh, duplicates are, or should I? Do you want me to go over, go over that? Okay, so uh, I'll start with. I'll give you an example of DNA sequence just to simplify uh, things. Simplify things. Um, so when you sequence uh, reads, when you generate fragments, uh, you're you're cutting the fragments uh, uh, of the DNA uh, random positions. So uh, the reads that you get from sequencing, they should uh, overlap. They should not pile up. Uh, what ends up happening sometimes is that you see pileups of, of reads that have the same exact uh, start and end. Uh, and that is not expected. Um, and that is happening because of the polymerase chain reaction. Uh, when you're trying to amplify fragments uh, in your library prep, uh, PCR, what, uh, what ends up happening is that it, it, it's biased towards certain fragments. So it amplifies some fragments more than others. So that's why you end up with uh, all these uh, fragments that are piled up. And that's, um, that's not good because uh, let's say that you have DNA-wise, if you have a mutation uh, in that fragment uh, and, and PCR amplifies that mutation and then you look and you try to quantify the frequency of the mutation, you'll say, oh wow, that is, there's a lot of reads that have that mutation, so it's happening at a high frequency. But in reality, it's not biological signal, it's actually just the PCR artifact. So to get around it, what we do is we collapse. So any reads that have the same exact start and end point, we'll just collapse them and we'll, get, we'll take one, uh, one read. Um, so that's what's done in DNA-seq. In RNA-seq, it's a bit more challenging because the start points, unlike DNA, they're not that random. Um, with RNA-seq, we have transcription start sites. So um, before blindly going ahead and, and removing these duplicates, uh, make sure you uh, assess it properly. And we'll go over uh, ways to assess uh, uh, duplicates when we talk about QC. But um, uh, assess it properly and um, yeah, because if you if you collapse, you might actually affect the dynamic range of your expression uh, values. So uh, we'll talk about methods to uh, to assess that, and then uh, in the QC section. Uh, the other question is uh, how much library depth? How much? Uh, how many lanes should I sequence? How many samples do I uh, pool in one lane? Um, so the answer to this question is also complex because it depends on so many different uh, factors and variables. So uh, for example, it depends on what you're trying to do. Are you uh, doing gene expression? Are you doing alternate expression? Are you doing mutation calling? Each one of these will have different requirements for, for uh, depth. Um, and again, the, 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 the problem with depth in RNA-seq is not the same as DNA-seq because DNA-seq you get this uniform um, coverage across the whole genome. So you, in DNA-seq, you say, okay, I'm going to sequence because I want 50x coverage. I want each base in my genome to have approximately 50 reads that cover it. But the problem with RNA is that uh, there is expression. So some genes might be covered, but they're not expressed. Other genes, they might have uh, very high expression. Um, so uh, that you have to, uh, to uh, think about. Uh, another thing is the tissue type. Uh, of interest, the RNA preparation uh, protocol. Um, are you doing uh, total RNA? Are you doing just the uh, coding uh, RNA, mRNA, uh, library construction? Uh, all of these affect uh, how much uh, uh, depth you want. Uh, also, uh, read length, uh, whether or not you're doing paired end or single end. Most of the project nowadays, they're doing paired end. I rarely see projects that are doing single end, single end uh, sequencing. And uh, the computa computational uh, approach and the resources that you have uh, available. More reads means uh, more computational resources that you need to do the alignment and the expression estimation. So there are two approaches that you can um, use to answer this question. First, sit down, write all these variables or these par parameters, and then try to find a publication that has similar set of parameters uh, uh, and, and, and see what coverage they've used or how many lanes they've, they've used and try to mimic that. Uh, if, if, if you can't do that and what you're doing is so unique and different from what's uh, published, then what you can do is you can just test it uh, on one sample, do one lane of sequencing, and then, in, and then go and then check. Uh, I'll show you in the QC section uh, of uh, a way to, uh, by looking at some saturation plots, you look at the coverage um, you, you sample your, your sequenced uh, sample, and then you look at the, the coverage at every uh, sampling stage 
I'll go into uh, detail there. But yeah, so you can do it before or you can do it after. And once you figure out how much depth you want, you have for that uh, or you need for that one sample, you can go back and apply that for all the other samples in your cohort. Uh, and this way, you're not wasting uh, money. Uh, but in general, one to two lanes of uh, sequencing nowadays should enable you to do everything you want to do. So um, one lane of sequencing, I believe, can go up to like 600 million uh, reads now. Uh, I've seen, I've, I think I've seen like 900, something crazy. It really depends on the, uh, on the protocol that you use uh, and uh, people who are doing the, the, the sequencing. But uh, yeah, two lanes should be more than enough uh, to do anything you want. Expression, isoform, uh, fusion, uh, mutation calling. But it can, can, can be expressive. Um, so that's why a lot of people, they, they would uh, rather pool samples within a lane. Uh, what mapping strategy should uh, you use for RNA-seq? So there are uh, different uh, mapping uh, uh, strategies. Uh, it really depends on uh, what you want to do. So there are two approaches. You can either take your data and align it to transcriptome reference, or you can take it and align it to a genome uh, reference. So um, we'll also talk about uh, the uh, uh, aligners that are available, and we'll get into details there. Uh, what if you don't have a reference genome? Uh, that's not an issue here because uh, most of you guys uh, have a reference genome to deal with. But if you don't, then do know the assembly is uh, one uh, approach. And um, there are a lot of tools that, that do that. Uh, it's outside of the scope of this uh, module, so we're not going to be covering any do know assembly today. All right, so that was the end of part one. Any questions so far? No? Good. Okay, so um, part two, we're going to be focusing on the uh, alignment and QC uh, uh, and, and visualization of um, your RNA, uh, aligned RNA uh, sequencing. So um, we're going to talk about alignment strategies, as I've mentioned before. Uh, we've picked uh, a couple of tools that we'll highlight and go over how they work. Uh, it's Bowtie, Top Hat, and HiSat2. Uh, introduction to BAM and BET formats. So if you're not familiar with uh, align, alignment uh, files and BET formats, I'm pretty sure you've seen uh, those in the past few days. Uh, we'll talk about basic manipulation of BAM files, uh, visualization of RNA-seq uh, using IGV. Do you guys use IGV this week? Perfect. Uh, and uh, then we'll focus, the second section will be on uh, alignment QC assessment uh, and BAM uh, read counting to determine um, expression status. Uh, I've talked before about uh, just general challenges on RNA-seq, uh, but uh, RNA-seq alignment itself has a lot of challenges as well. So uh, the, f the first challenge is the computational cost. I just told you that each lane of sequencing uh, has 500, 600 million uh, reads. So that's a lot of reads that you have to uh, process and align. So uh, you, will, you will need uh, a lot of computational resources to be able to process that many reads. In addition to that, also, the read length has increased uh, a lot. And the tutorial that we're doing today, uh, it's an old data set, and read length was about 36 uh, base pair, uh, paired and 36 base pair. Uh, it's really hard to find uh, studies right now that would do such short read length. So, so most of the read lengths nowadays are uh, 100, 2 by 100. Uh, there's 2 by 150. You also have pack bio that has very long uh, uh, reads. The tools that we're going to be talking about today, they are uh, mainly designed for studies that would do paired end 2 by 100, 200, 150. So they're not designed for things that are extremely long or extremely short. Um, Another challenge, uh, which I mentioned as well, is the uh, fact, the presence of introns. So there, there are these large uh, gaps that you have to worry about when you're trying to align your exons back, especially if you're trying to align them to the genome. Because the RNA does not have the introns, but then the, the whole genome that you're trying to reference, that you're trying to align to, has these introns. So you're going to have to somehow take your RNA, split it, and then figure out where these uh, intronic boundaries are. Uh, when you're doing the alignment. So that's, that's a big challenge for these uh, tools. Um, and I also showed you how 
RNA-seq uh, is very resourceful. There is a lot of data that you can get out of it, different uh, data that you can get out of it. So uh, because of that, um, uh, it's very unlikely that you're just going to process your data once and you'll be done with it. Um, the fact that there are so many different tools that will do different things uh, means that you're probably going to have to uh, reprocess uh, multiple multiple times. Also, the, the gene annotation is constantly being updated every uh, every year. Uh, you get new genes, you get new transcripts. Uh, so chances are you're going to go back and reprocess with the updated uh, uh, assemblies. Um, and HiSat2 is uh, one tool out of many tools uh, that are available uh, out there. So we'll just cover that uh, today, uh, but feel free to uh, pick any uh, uh, aligner uh, that you want. Aligners usually they are split into three classes. So we have the de novo assembly, um, we have uh, the alignment to transcriptome, and uh, alignment to reference genome. Um, which alignment strategy is the best? It really depends what you have, what you're trying to do. De novo assembly, as I've mentioned before, is meant for projects that do not have a reference. Um, also, it, uh, it might be good for samples that are, might be too complex. There is a lot of polymorphism uh, in your sample. And if you try to align samples that have so much polymorphism to the reference, you might actually miss out on some interesting events. Uh, so in that case, you might want to use de novo assembly as well. Um, you can also align to the transcriptome. And uh, here saying short reads is because I guess uh, you, you want, um, uh, you're just aligning to the uh, exon, you don't want to worry about exon axon uh, junctions, so that's why it might be good for uh, shorter reads. Uh, but you can, uh, you can either align to transcriptome or, or whole genome. Uh, today we're going to be focusing on uh, aligning to a reference, uh, a whole genome uh, reference. <clears throat> and as I said, each one of these strategies, they come with uh, uh, different tools and packages. Um, so in terms of uh, aligners, there are a lot of aligners that are uh, published um, and available out there for, for uh, public use. Um, and each one of these tools, each one of these aligners, when it comes out, it tries to do uh, three things. It tries to increase the accuracy of the calls. It tries to um, speed up the processing time and cut down in memory usage. Uh, so every tool that comes out, it tries to beat the other tools by... by um, uh, modifying or tweaking these three parameters. Um, I just want to highlight a few tools that uh, we have either uh, taught in this workshop or have used uh, personally. Um, one of the first ones is uh, Top Hat and Bowtie. So uh, these two became really popular around, uh, say, 2008, uh, I believe 2009. Um, and Bowtie Top Hat package, uh, the way it worked is that Bowtie was the backbone aligner. So it was very good for short read alignment. So it would align uh, the, the, the reads, and then Top Hat would take the alignment information from Bowtie, and it would try to use it to assemble the reads to make transcripts. Uh, and then you take those, and then you pass them to expression estimation tools. And that was cufflinks. Um, the, it was good because it has uh, very good support. A lot of people used it. A lot of papers used it. Uh, if you have any questions, if you run into any problem, you'll probably have an answer uh, with Top Hat. The only problem was the fact that it was a bit slow. So if you're trying to run one lane of sequencing, it might actually take you uh, days to, uh, to process. So um, it wasn't until uh, Star came out, and uh, Star really uh, cut down in the processing time. Uh, but the, uh, the thing is, what it did is that it increased memory usage. So, in order to be able to run Star, you're going to have to you're going to have to uh, have a lot of computational resources. You need a machine that has a very high uh, memory. Um, so, you probably need to use a, a, a cluster. You can't really run uh, Star on your local uh, local machine. But it did cut down in the processing time. It went from days to minutes, uh, which was which was great. Um, and then. Uh, the next thing that happened, uh, uh, HiSat came out. And HiSat, what it tried to do is it tried to cut down on processing time and memory uh, by using a variety of uh, reference indexing methods. And so and it managed to do that. So now HiSat uh, runs the same running time as Star, and it uses a lot less uh, memory uh, than, than uh, Star. So just to give you an example, if you have uh, a lane that has 100 million reads um, with 
top hat. Uh, it would take a few days to, uh, to process. With star, it would take uh, half an hour to, uh, to run, but it would require 28 gigs of, of RAM. With high sat, 100 million reads, half an hour, only 4 gigs of RAM. So it was a huge uh, cut down in terms of, of memory usage. And that's the tool we're going to be uh, talking about today. We're going to be using as well in the um, tutorial. Yes? Can you maybe also comment the accuracy of certain times? Yeah. So, um, so the paper claims that they're, the calls are very accurate and they're more, uh, more well, same level of accuracy as, as a star. Uh, so it's very comparable, STAR and, uh, and HiSat, in terms of uh, accuracy. I personally have not done any uh, uh, comparison myself, uh, but I'm just basing it on, their, on the HiSat paper. No. Yeah. Um, the Y-axis, it was that time or that memory? Or that so, oh, 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 on the... No, sorry, on the previous uh, one. This one? The Y-axis thing. Uh, <laughs> the these are different programs. So each one of these is different tools, and this is the time they came out. Oh, oh, so this doesn't... So it's just sorted by the time they, uh, uh, they were published. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so, should you use slice-aware or unspliced uh, mapper? Uh, short answer is, if you are aligning your um, RNA-seq to whole genome reference, then you have to use a splice-aware uh, aligner. <coughs> if you're aligning it to transcriptome reference, then you don't need to use a splice-aware uh, aligner. Uh, and there are a lot of splice-aware uh, aligners out there. There's HiSat2, TopPath, Star, Map, Sli Map Splice, and uh, etc. And if, you, if you've read the HiSat paper, it does, uh, it does compare all of these aligners uh, in terms of performance, runtime, memory, and all that stuff, and accuracy. Um, so, HiSat uh, and HiSat2, um, as I've mentioned, they've really uh, cut down on, on uh, processing time. And uh, just like I said, they did that by using uh, uh, two, sort, uh, two, in, uh, two, in, uh, two types of indexes. So there's the global indexing, and then there's local indexing that is uh, uh, going on. Um, so what does, that, what does that mean? So previously, let's think uh, top hat. Uh, two or a top hat, if you have a short read, um, let's say it's eight bases long, um, short reads are not unique, which means that you can find multiple locations in the genome. When you're trying to align short reads, uh, it's time consuming because you are going to go through the whole genome, you're going to find multiple spots in the genome, and then you're going to have to decide which, uh, which, which one of these locations uh, is, is uh, accurate or more, uh, more suitable. Uh, what HiSat did is that it created this local index. So it took the whole genome, it split it into 48,000 bits. And the way it did it so that these short reads, when you look for them in the local bin, there's only one uh, copy. You, you won't find multiple copies of that short read in the, in the local index. And that's how it's saving so much time uh, when it's trying to do the alignment. So let me walk you through, uh, I'm going to go through three examples, um, and we'll walk through how HiSat uh, does the, the alignment. So the three examples are right here, A, B, C. A is an example where the read is fully spanning an exon, so there is no, no boundaries. Uh, and let's assume that reads here are 100 base, base pairs. So 100 base pair fully spanning uh, the exon. The second example, uh, B, we have a read that... Um, let's say 90 bases span one axon, and there's like 10 bases that span the uh, second, second axon. Um, and then the, th the third case, it would be a read where half of it spans one axon, and the other half spans the other axon. So when you're trying to align the first case, um, the tool goes through a series of uh, uh, global indexing, local indexing and uh, extensions. So I'll tell you what that means. So the, the first thing that we'll do, it will try to look for uh, a seed for that read throughout the whole genome. Once it finds 28 base pairs, the first 28 base pairs in the genome, then it will anchor that read. And then it starts, after 28, it starts just extending. So it'll just extend one base at a time until it gets to the end of the read. That's case one. Case two. Um, we'll do the same thing. We're going to start with 
um, uh, global indexing. It's going to find it, 28 bases. Um, it anchors it, then starts just extending one base at a time until you, ha you hit this spot right here, the first mismatch. Um, when it hits the first mismatch, it's an indication that you reached an intron. It stops. And it switches to local index. So that is the biggest difference here. Before, it used to switch to another global index. Then you would have to go and look for that 10 bases that's left through the whole genome. And you'll find multiple spots, and then you have to go and pick which one is, uh, uh, is best suited for the, the, the first part of the read. But here, because we have a local index, um, the 10 bases, it's just going to look with it, uh, look for it within the local index. There's only one, there's only going to be one occurrence of that, uh, of that read. And um, it will uh, do um, anchoring as well, but this time we'll only use eight bases. Uh, so look at the first eight bases, it will anchor and then extend the rest of that uh, small read. Um, sorry, the third scenario where you have half of the read in one axon, half of the read in the other axon. Again, we'll start with the same thing. Global indexing, first 28 bases, you anchor, extend, extend, extend. You get to the middle, you stop, you switch to local indexing, you go find the first eight bases in the local uh, index, you anchor, and then you extend uh, the rest of your read. So it's just uh, global index, anchoring, and extension. You're just going through that cycle. Is that clear? Um, should you allow multi-mapping of reads? So, um, as I've mentioned, um, if reads are not uh, unique, you can have multiple uh, uh, locations uh, in the whole genome. But sometimes, um, even the, the, the read can actually have multiple locations in, in the genome, and it will map perfectly to multiple locations in the genome. And when we talk about DNA, when that happens, a lot of the aligners, there are options in the aligners where you say, um, pick randomly, the, pick one of the reads uh, randomly, or pick the top one, or because all of these reads have the same exact quality score. So how are you going to decide which read to report? Um, so you can either r randomly pick one read or report everything. Um, you, have, you have these uh, options. Um, in RNA, it really depends on what you're doing. Again, um, if you are um, doing variant calling, then you might want to disallow uh, this this option and do not report multiple uh, multiple uh, multiply mapped reads. But if you're doing expression, you really don't want to affect the dynamic range of your expression. So you might want to let uh, uh, the tool report uh, multi mapped reads when you're doing expression. <clears throat> So in terms of output of uh, all these aligners, you get a SAM file and a BAM file. Uh, SAM stands for the Sequence Alignment Map Format, and BAM is the binary version of, of SAM. Uh, you, you guys have worked with BAM over the past week, correct? OK, perfect. So I don't have to go through uh, details. Uh, you can convert BAM to SAM and, and, and so on. It's a uh, great idea to convert everything to BAM. It will save a lot of space. Um, and you've probably gone over this, uh, just an example of a uh, SAM or a BAM file. You have the header section and you have the, uh, the body. The header section will contain information uh, about the, um, uh, the, the, the sample, the, uh, some techniques. You can put whatever information you want in the header section. Uh, it will also have the align, aligner that was used and all the parameters that were used in the aligner. So when we used HiSat, it will actually have the command of uh, HiSat that was used. And that's very important because if you get a BAM file and you don't know how it was aligned, you can just look at the header and it will tell you how it was aligned, what parameters were used um, to do the alignment. Um, BED is another file format that is very important when we are uh, dealing with RNA-seq. Uh, BED is just a, a format where you have a chromosome, start, end. So if you're looking for uh, certain regions within the transcriptome, um, let's say you're looking for a specific gene within the transcriptome that you want to subset out of your BAM file, you don't want to look at everything in the BAM file, you can create a small text file called BET file, and you can say, okay, chromosome, uh, where the gene is, the start of the gene, the end of the gene, gene name. And there are tools where you provide it the, the small BET file, and you give it the BAM file, and it will subset. It will take all these reads that are within those boundaries that you specified. Uh, so you can look at, uh, you can 
plot the coverage, uh, you can look at the quality, um, and uh, you can assess expression for just certain regions in the genome or transcriptome. Um, and these are some um, uh, tools that you can use to um, uh, view BAM files, there are SAM tools, BAM tools, Picard, and for BET files, you can do BET tools and uh, BET ops. Um, sorting uh, SAM and BAM really depends on the, uh, on the tools that you're using, but there are two ways you can sort them. You can sort them by position or you can sort them by uh, read name. Uh, you sort them by position if you are interested in uh, just easily pull out uh, reads from certain position uh, in the transcriptome. Uh, but if you're trying to uh, maintain the pair information, uh, you might want to sort them by read name because the read name would have, uh, at the end of the read name, you'll have read one, read two. So if you sort them by read name, the pairs will always be together. So if you're looking for fusions, for example, um, uh, then it would be better to sort them by name. It will be easier for the tools to uh, um, Pick that information. Um, once you have the BAM file, you can actually vis visualize it. So you can open it up in IGV, and I believe you guys have used IGV. Uh, you, you said yes. And uh, in IGV, um, there is uh, the coverage uh, track. There is the uh, this is the transcom assembly that you load into IGV. Uh, so it's it's really exciting uh, to, to look at these things because uh, you try to match all these exons with these uh, coverage uh, uh, pileups, and uh, sometimes you end up discovering that there is coverage in areas or intronic regions which could indicate that maybe um, this is a new exon or uh, a new uh, a new assembly that does not uh, novel assembly that does not exist, or um, or it could be a mapping error. Um, but yeah, so you can uh, you can do that. I highly recommend you do that after you do the alignment. Not for everything, just pick a uh, pick a sample. You can even uh, instead of loading the whole BAM file because it's big, you can use the bed tools that I just used and subset a certain region regime of interest and then look at uh, look at it in IGB. This thing, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So that could indicate um, either poor poor coverage, um, some bias, uh, three prime bias. There are many things that uh, uh, that uh, can go wrong. And as as I said, it could be that it's uh, um, a novel uh, a transcript. Um, that actually could be two, two exons and not one exon, and it's just the, the known transcript is one exon. Um, let's see. Okay. So now, um, now that we have the BAM file, we want to assess uh, how good the alignment was. So the first level of quality assessment happened at the RIN uh, when we looked at the RIN, and that was before we did any, any sequencing. At this point, we're assessing um, how well the sequencing and the uh, mapping did. There's a step that I skipped, which is uh, FastQ QC. So uh, you can have. Did you guys use FastQC uh, or FastQ uh, quality assessment before? No. Okay. So there's a tool that you can use to uh, uh, run. It's called FastQC. You run it on the FastQ file, and that will tell you uh, how what the, what the quality of the sequences prior to alignment. Um, so that's usually done. And then the third level of QC is this one, where after the alignment is done, you look at how well uh, the reads aligned to your transcriptome or to your genome. Uh, so I'm just going to go over some metrics that uh, you can use for your uh, QC report. So there is the three, to prime, two, three and five uh, prime bias, nucleotide content, uh, base and read quality, PCR artifact, the duplication that we talked about, uh, sequence. Uh, and these are just some examples. There's there's a lot more stuff that you can uh, use, but um, you can start with this set of uh, parameters. Um, so three and uh, three and five prime bias. Uh, the pi bias can be introduced um, by the um, pr library prep technique that you, you use. So remember how I talked about different library prep technique when you have total RNA and you want to get uh, mRNA. 
you can do poly A selection or cDNA capture. Uh, and when you're doing poly A selection, there might be some bias uh, where you get more coverage uh, for for uh, to, towards the three prime end of your um, uh, transcript versus the five prime end. Um, so one way to check for that, um, th this is based off a tool called RCXC um, that does quality uh, uh, checks for you. So what this tool does, it takes the top thousand transcripts and it will um, uh, split the transcripts into 100 bins. And for each bin, it will look at the coverage for, for that bin. And here we're looking at each curve represents a sample and these are the normalized positions from 5 prime to 3 prime. And you notice that your, uh, your cohort splits into two, uh, two patterns, where this is what you expect. You want even coverage across your transcript. It doesn't matter where 5 prime or 3 prime. But you get this cohort of samples where there is a lot more coverage on the 3 prime end versus the 5 prime end which could be due to the selection, selection method. So what do you do at this point? You can, uh, there are m multiple options. You can either go back and figure out what caused this. Is it your uh, library uh, uh, technique? Maybe you can change the, the kit because some kits can introduce some bias. If you can do that, then you can computationally uh, adjust for, for that. There, there are tools that you can use to um, fix this bias uh, before you, you go ahead and do expression uh, estimation. Because if you go ahead and do expression estimation, um, what will end up happening is that you're going to bias the expression estimation as well. Some genes will have more expression just because they were selected uh, by your uh, kit uh, better than other, other genes. Um, yes. And, um, and if you it's, it's best if you can't fix it or you can, you can potentially fix it. If you're doing any downstream analysis or you're fitting any models, uh, you might want to include that covariance or that variable in your model just so that um, uh, you adjust for, for, for this in your uh, statistical model downstream. Um, another thing you can look at uh, is the nucleotide content. So here I am looking at the uh, base distribution, how many A, C, G, T at every base in your read. So uh, this is an example of a very short read. It has only 35 bases. And at each base, I'm looking at the distribution. You expect the distribution to be equal. You expect to have 25% A, 25% G, C, T, and so on, um, which is happening around here. However, uh, with Illumina sequencing, um, they use these random primers to, for, for reverse uh, the transcription of RNA fragments to cDNA, and it's the cDNA that you're sequencing. Uh, it turns out that these random primers are not so random. They actually, at the beginning of the read, what, what ha ends up happening is that they have some uh, bias or preference towards some bases. Um, and so, so one way to deal with it is you can trim the first 10 bases. So plot this, look at your data, see if you have this issue. Uh, if you do, you can um, just trim the first 10 bases and then keep the rest of the keep the rest of the read and align that. Um, you can also look at the quality distribution. So again, for each base within your read, we're looking at the uh, for all the samples, we're looking at the distribution of the quality of each base. And when I talk about quality, we're using uh, a score called FRET score. And FRET score is simply just the negative log ten of the probability that the base calling is done wrong. Uh, what does that mean? If you get a FRET score of 30, it means that there is one in a thousand chance that the base you called is not the correct base. Uh, so you want a higher score, uh, which means a less likelihood of error. Yes? Does that just depend on the machine? Yes, it is dependent on the sequencing platform. Uh, and um, you, you, end, you tend to see a, a reduction... Um, well, it depends on the machine. It depends on, on, on the library prep protocol, too. There are a lot of uh, things that, uh, that could go wrong. Uh, but you, you, uh, you see a, a, like usually see like a bit of a decrease uh, in, the, in the quality. So you want to make sure that um, all of the bases, or not most of the bases uh, in your reads, they have a, a, a 
a FRET score more than 30. Um, 20 or 30, that's usually the uh, accepted threshold. For quality? Yes, so all of these plots are generated with RCXC. And I don't know if we have RCXC installed. Uh, we might have, I don't know if you'll have the time, because uh, the instant will run out right by the end of the day. So um, if you're taking the RNA-seq workshop in July, then we'll get to work with uh, uh, RCXC. Uh, but yes, you can try to install RCXC. There are other tools as well that will do that. Uh, and you can also, this you don't need to use tools. You can um, impl implement it yourself, depending on how much background you have in bioinformatics, because it's, uh, it's not, too, not too complex. I would start. I would start with uh, these tools, R six C. PCR duplication. So we said that um, that could be an issue. Uh, we can't just blindly uh, collapse reads because in RNA the start sites are not um, random because of the transcription uh, uh, sites. So one way you can assess uh, PCR is uh, this plot right here. Um, on the x-axis, it's looking at uh, how many duplicates there are, or the occurrence of the read, and then the number of reads uh, for that specific occurrence. So that's, uh, you see the read once, twice, three times, four times, hundred, and so on. Ideally, what you want, you want a curve that would look like this. Like, you want very uh, low number of uh, reads that happen multiple times. And what the tool is doing is that it's assessing the duplication uh, using the position, the, f the beginning of the first read, and the end of the second read. That's how it's, uh, it's assessing the duplication. That's one way. The other way is actually looking at the, the sequence of the uh, bases, and it's comparing the sequence of the, the, the two reads. And you want to make sure that the sequence base and the mapping base, uh, that they're, they're both very low. Yeah? So did your kids have the UMI? Uh Attachments, so each or each CDNA has its own kind of leading unique sequence that allows us to find the PCR or PCR duplicates. Okay. What, what do you know if any tools can incorporate that filtering for that for the UMI? I'm not sure actually. Yeah, I'm not aware of any tool that does that. Yeah. Uh, how would maybe a curve loop or a sample where no PCR is run at all versus one that is fairly bad? Oh, you want to see the difference between? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I, I don't have an example of a. Of a if you, even if you didn't run PCR, you still would expect some. Oh, if you didn't run PCR, then you shouldn't have that issue. It's, it, yeah, I mean, the issue arises from PCR or some sort of amplification that you're doing in your library library prep. If there is an amplification step, then uh, you want to check for that. If there isn't, then that's not an issue. Yeah. So uh, it does that by looking at the mapping. So you're looking at the position of the first read, the beginning of the, uh, uh, of the first read, and the end of the second read. Because you want to look at both fragments, um, not just like both, both reads, not just one. So yeah, for the paired end, you're looking at the beginning because it's less likely that uh, um, if you, yeah. It and then exactly matches. Matches, yeah, if you see multiple fragments having the same exact uh, beginning of first read and then end of second read, or they have the same exact sequence as well. The context of the sequence is exactly the same. So that's what the tool checks. It checks for two things. Yeah. So, yeah, how to read, yeah. So, um, it, yeah, it can be a bit confusing. So here you're looking at the number of duplicates. And this is the number of reads that have that level of duplication. So, the, 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 the so yeah, so this would be uh, the read has one duplicate, or happens once, or twice, or three times, or four times, or 100 times. Yeah. Um, and then here would be the number of reads that have that level of duplication. So if you see that would read, uh, no. So the y-axis is? Y-axis would be the, the count of the reads in the transcriptome that have that level of, of duplication. So ideally, you're looking for a very steep... Exactly, like extremely, extremely steep. Yeah, so a, a bad sample would, some, would have something like this. Like it would, it would be like right here. You have to like essentially collapse 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, sequencing depth, how, um, how many lanes? So we talked about um, just writing down parameters, looking for publications, and we said if you don't uh, have a publication where you're doing so unique, then maybe you can do a saturation um, uh, plot. And this is what I meant by saturation plot. So what are we doing here? We are, let's say that you did um, one lane of sequence, you decided to go and do one lane of sequencing for that sample, because you really did not have any idea how deep you should go. So you just did one lane of sequencing, then you took the BAM file, and what this tool does, R6C as well, is generated by R6C, will take the BAM file and it will uh, sample 10% of the reads, 20% of the reads, 30%, 40%, up to 100%. And for each level, it will try to look at the fraction of novel junctions and known junctions. And that's what we're plotting here. So on the x-axis, we have the, uh, the, the subsample, how many fractions. Uh, and then on the y-axis, we have the, uh, the number of um, uh, known, <coughs> known junctions versus novel junctions. And what we're looking for, we're looking for uh, a point at which the curve actually saturates. Because at that point, no matter how many reads you're adding, you're not getting any more junctions. You've already discovered all the junctions that are uh, uh, there in the sample. Uh, and you should stop at that point. Now, you will notice that the, uh, the known junctions, they saturate a lot faster than uh, novel junctions. And that is due to the fact that um, a lot of these junctions could be false positives. Um, the, the novel junction that you're discovering, it just it could be that you don't have enough uh, coverage or um, uh, they're, they're, not, uh, uh, they're, they're false positives. So you have to be uh, careful. So you can look at uh, the combined uh, curve or you can look at the known curve uh, and see where that saturates. So for, for this, we can stop at 20 to 30 percent. Uh, of the reads, and then you go and say, okay, 30% of the reads, how, what, what is that number? And I'm going to use that number, and maybe like add a padding, like add uh, a few hundred reads uh, uh, to that, or, and then say, okay, that's going to be my, my number of reads that I need uh, for my population, and you can go back and then sequence uh, that many reads for the rest of the cohort. Uh, so you can also generate this plot. So RCC does this, it does the junction, but you can also look at expression patterns as well. So you can do the same exact thing, subset the BAM, and then look at and go and do expression, and then look at families of genes. Are you discovering any new families of gene? Is expression changing for uh, the genes that you're interested in as you increase the, uh, the, the depth? Um, if that's, uh, again, you can look at a saturation level at which no more uh, genes are being introduced or discovered, then you can say, okay, I'm going to stop there. And you can do, yeah, I can do both and then find a, a threshold that would work for both expression and splice junctions. Yes? But you've already sequenced. Exactly. So you do this for one sample. Oh, okay. And then you go back and then before, before you do the whole cohort. Um, if you have 20 samples, you just do it for one, figure out what the number is, and then you go back and then. Uh, you sequence the rest. Yeah, it will be cost effective um, that way. Yes. Um, Sorry. Would it be, uh, I guess, intuitive thing now, but would it be possible to sort of sequence the same RNA sample? So you, you decide to do one lane, you get rid of RNA in the fridge, on the freezer, and like, turn out you didn't quite have the coverage you hope. Would you still sequence that pool that you will delete eventually? Or? Yeah, I see what you're saying. So you would take the sequences and you would uh, merge the sequences yeah. after alignment, or actually even before alignment. Uh, before before, al before alignment would yeah. be better because yeah, as long as uh, you do it before alignment, it should be okay. And you have to. It would be nice to maybe do them separately and then do it together just to see if there is any artifact that's being introduced by mixing the, the reads, or even check the quality of the sequences separately. And if they, the quality is OK, then you can mix them. But make sure you do it before alignment, because the alignment is doing transcript assembly. And you need more, ev more reads, more evidence. So you'll have more power if you combine the uh, sequences to detect transcripts. But you don't think it would be like some sort of systematic difference, potentially, from the different 
seamlessly run? I mean, there, there, there always is, but and it depends on how much variability. Are you doing it at two different centers? Are you doing single end versus paired end? Like, it really depends on, if you try to minimize the variables as much as possible, then it should be okay. I think. It, happens, it happens a lot for DNA. Um, we do multiple lanes and then you combine the uh, raw sequences for DNA and then you do the alignment. Um, but I guess RNA is a bit more sensitive because maybe if you did it five months later, the RNA might have degraded. Um, so you might want to check that f first. But yeah. Yeah. Um, the other way of uh, doing the saturation plots uh, by using number of genes to detect RCQC does this. Mm -hmm. so it doesn't. So it only does the splice junction. Um, I guess you'll have to write your own. Uh, once you get the idea or the concept, it should be easy uh, uh, to implement. Because the uh, subsetting the BAM file, you can do that with um, BET tools, I think. Or you can actually use it with SAM tools. Uh, SAM tools dash S. If you put dash S and you put the fraction, it will, uh, if you put dash S.3, uh, it will take 30 randomly, so like 30% of your reads in the BAM file. So, it will randomly select reads. Uh, so you can change the dash S, run it multiple times, generate different subsets, and then you can, yourself, you can go and look, look for a gene. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Um, you can also look at the uh, base distribution. Uh, so like what fraction of bases that you've aligned are uh, coding bases, what uh, fraction is UTR, intronic, intergenic, and so on. And the fractions will uh, look different depending on what technique you use. So if you're using total RNA, you'll have less uh, coding bases. If you used uh, mRNA techniques, polyA or cDNA, you're going to have a lot more uh, coding uh, bases. So it's always good to check that uh, as well to make sure that it matches the technique that you used for library prep. Um, Insert size, um, so I think I just wanted to define this um, because with, I think with high sat, with high sat you don't have to specify uh, what the expected distance between the reads, but with top hat, it was an option that you had to uh, feed to top hat. So you tell it what is the expected distance between the reads and it will look at that expected distance and it will see if it's more, if what they're observing is more, because if it is more, then it will classify it as intronic region or it will classify it as a fusion. It will use what you predict, um, or um, it will use that number to uh, predict uh, or classify those uh, reads. But with high sight, you don't have to do that. I think it learns that on its own, so you don't have to worry about it. But uh, the reason why I put it here is that um, uh, you also want to have it as a QC measure. You want to look at the, uh, the, 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 the library size uh, from mapping. Um, and insert size can be defined uh, in different ways. So here we have the, the two reads, read one, read two. Uh, fragment, when, you, when you say fragment size, we're talking about the distance from the beginning of read one to end of read two, including the adapters. That would be the fragment size. Uh, insert size is just the uh, that without the uh, adapters. And then inner mate is the inner distance, end of read one and beginning of read two. Yes? So for RCC, um, does it output like a warning message if there's something off? Like if I have 50 samples, do I have to look at for each sample, or will it tell me what to look at? Yeah, so it will, it will tell you, so I think RCC runs per sample, it doesn't run as a cohort. So it will not generate a cohort level report. So just like you said, each sample will get, it will get its own report, uh, and you will get text output and uh, I believe HTML output. Uh, so what we did in production was we parsed the, uh, the text or the HTML to look for errors. And that's how we would flag uh, the, the samples based on. It doesn't itself have, um, i trying to think. It doesn't have a way, like thresholds that you can put in to say this will pass or fail. 
you're going to have to parse it yourself, set your thresholds yourself, and then you can classify the sample as good or bad. And that's the other, that's the other issue with, with DNA. It was really simple because you can just uh, uh, look at coverage. And you can say, okay, this sample has uh, less than 50x. We're going to flag it as a, as a bad sample. Let's look, let's look at it again. You can look at coverage or you can look at the quality. But here, there are so many other vari uh, variables that you have to uh, uh, consider. How do you classify computationally or uh, uh, in an automated way, how do you classify a sample as being bad? There are so many different metrics that we saw that could be good, could be bad. And sometimes you just, it's borderline, you can say, okay, fine. Like, uh, even if uh, one metric is not good, I can still go ahead and, and analyze it. And I'll worry about it when I do downstream analysis. I'll adjust for it when I do downstream analysis. So yeah, automating the process is, is challenging. Just a quick comment from the back. Yeah. Um, I've used in my experience a tool called MultiQC, which, uh, which creates, um, if you have so many samples, exponential samples, which we usually have for single cell um, cases. And that MultiQC is worth checking out. Um, if you want to create a report, uh, that's it. If you want to is it for DNA seq or RNA seq? It's RNA seq. Oh, perfect. OK. It, it recognizes the outputs from um, including RCQC and many other software. Okay. Multi, multi QC. Multi QC. Okay. Sounds good. We'll add it to the resources for next year, maybe. Thank you. Um, okay. So, um, one other thing you can do with um, uh, IGV is uh, mutation calling. That's something we're not covering here. Um, and this is a very simplified version of mutation calling. So this is designed, uh, you can use IGV to uh, look at variants, but don't do that for all the variants in RNA seq because it'll take forever. But this is this slide is designed for people that maybe have uh, done DNA sequencing, they've looked at variants, they've uh, filtered and they just want to do some sort of validation where they look at the uh, at these variants in RNA-seq to see if they exist on RNA-seq as well. And you can do that in IGV. You can uh, look at the pileup of the reads and look at the uh, alleles and see what fraction of the reads are mutated and so on. Yeah. Can I just ask a quick question, question about that? Um, I guess, is there any way why, why uh, variant calling from RNA-seq would be less helpful? Yeah. So there is the concept of RNA editing that could uh, introduce some variation. There is also, based on my experience, um, there is a lot of false positives around splice junctions because there is a lot of artifact that's being introduced by the false positive splice junction that HiSat or Top Hat is doing. So when it's trying to assemble the uh, the splice junctions. It's not going to be 100% accurate, right? Like it's going to have, it's going to try to like uh, find them, but it won't uh, find them all the time. And because of that, the sequences are going to be uh, not aligned properly, and you're going to find a lot of variants. So if you do, if you do, want, if you call, if you call SNVs from RNA seq, and then uh, look at how close those SNVs are from splice uh, junctions, you will see an enrichment. You'll see a lot of these SNVs are very close. So you can add that as a filter. Uh, if it's a very, if it's within proximity to a splice junction, get rid of it. But other than these two reasons, I don't see a reason why uh, it won't be as good as DNA. I think another problem is RNA is not expressed DNA. That's true. There's no expression. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can use the expression information to, as I said, to uh, prioritize these mutations but uh, some might not be expressed. And then it will be hard to tell whether it's not expressed and there is no coverage. That's another issue that you're going to have to run into as well. OK. How are we doing in terms of time? I don't have time on me. Do you guys know what time it is? Uh, 12, 2.45. And the break is supposed to be at 3. OK. So maybe we can Let's try to finish. And then we can take a break. So that after we come back from the break, uh, we can just work on the tutorial, and then we'll run uh, through it together. Mm. 
Okay, so <clears throat> we've aligned, we have uh, checked the quality of the alignment, everything is good. We can go ahead now and assess the expression and do expression. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> Oh, there. Um, so we can uh, uh, now go ahead and do expression estimation for known uh, genes and transcripts. Uh, we will look at um, FPKM, which is a, a unit of measuring expression, uh, and we'll compare it, compare it to raw counts, uh, we'll look at differential expression methods, and things that we can do with the uh, expression and differential expression uh, in terms of visualization and downstream uh, analysis. So, um, as I mentioned, one way to look at expression is uh, IGV. So, let's say that you have a gene of interest and you're really excited. You get the BAM file and you want to you look at the, the gene and see if it's differential expressed between two conditions. You can do that. So, you can uh, pull condition number one, BAM, condition number two, BAM, um, and then look at the, uh, the different isoforms or transcripts that you have. And you can assess expression by looking visually at uh, the, the coverage and see if uh, one gene has uh, more coverage than uh, uh, the other uh, in these tracks. However, uh, there are a few problems uh, by doing it this way. Because number one, you are not really considering that uh, these two libraries, they, one of them you could have sequenced one eighth of a lane and the other one you could have sequenced two lanes. So clearly, you're going to have a lot more reads uh, with one versus uh, the other. So you have to keep in mind how deep did you sequence, uh, and that will affect. You can do it only if you had exactly the same amount of sequencing for both. You can do that uh, visual comparison. The other problem is uh, gene length. So you can't just compare two genes, because one gene, if it's longer than the other, it will clearly have more reads that will cover it. So you'll need to adjust for the length of the gene. So these are the two things that you need to adjust for, how deep you've sequenced and uh, how long the genes are. And that's where FPKM uh, uh, comes, comes in handy. So RPKM um, stands for reads per kilobase of transcript per million mapped reads. What does that mean? You're just taking the reads, you're normalizing them by the total number of reads in the library and by the gene length. Um, I'll we'll show you the, the formula in a bit, but it's pretty much what I just said. You're just dividing with these two numbers. Uh, FPKM, the difference between RPKM and FPKM is that um, RPKM just looks at total reads. Um, FPKM looks at fragments. It will look at paired reads. So we'll count a paired read as one fragment. Um, and then you're doing the same thing. You're counting those fragments, you're dividing them by the total number of fragments uh, in your uh, library, and dividing by the uh, gene length. Um, and just like I mentioned, it will get rid of the bias, uh, different library depth, and different gene length. Um, I believe HiSat also reports another uh, measure called TPM. So how is FPKM different from TPM? Um, FPKM, just like I said, it takes the, um, uh, the reads, it divides them by the total um, uh, depth, and divide by gene length. TPM just switches the, uh, the order. So the first thing you would do is divide by the length of their transcript, and then you would take these uh, values, and then you divide by the, uh, length, uh, the, the depth, total depth. So just the order at which you normalize is a bit different, and you end up with two uh, different values. And once you get the FPKMs, you can uh, pass them and do some statistical tests for differential uh, expressions. So where, uh, what do we use for that? Um, for, with HiSat, there, there is a package called StringTie uh, that does uh, expression, expression estimation um, for the, uh, uh, the sample transcripts. And uh, for Top hat used to, it was called cufflinks. So if you're using cufflinks, then it's it's parallel to uh, string tie. And I'm not going to go into the details of uh, how exactly it, it does things, but um, uh, what it tries to do is that it tries to um, it will look at all the possible paths for the the transcripts, 
and then it will take each read and it will try to assign a probability of where uh, for, for, for each one of these paths it will assign a probability of this read belonging to this specific path and the, the path with the highest probability will uh, the read will go under that, that path or that uh, isoform um, and and then the read is gone then you go through the, the next read so once once you assign a read to a specific transcript you move it aside and then you go at, you you go with the rest of the reads and you do that for all the reads until you're done uh, with with uh, all of the reads so when you do that um, you will get a uh, transcript assembly per sample. So you're doing this processing per sample. Each sample you will run it uh, once and you're gonna get an assembly per sample. But what happens is that sometimes um, you might not get the full picture of the, the transcript from just one sample. So it's good that you go back and you combine all these transcripts from these the samples that you came up with and come up with one assembly based on all the samples that you've sequenced. And then that assembly, you'll have more confidence in that assembly. And then you take that assembly and you go back and uh, re-quantify or like redo the expression based on this merged assembly because you have more confidence in this merged assembly than you did before. So you can go back for each one of these samples and then look at the expression for each one uh, of the samples for that specific merged assembly. Um, Another important function is GFF compare. So what that does is that it's, uh, it looks at the assembly that you generated and you can compare it to uh, assemblies that are established or, or known, known assemblies. And it will tell you what fraction of uh, assemblies are novel, what fraction are known, uh, and it will do that comparison uh, for you. With uh, string tie, you can choose to, there are different modes. Uh, and again, we're not gonna have the time to go through all of that here. Uh, but know that there are different modes. Uh, if you're interested in known uh, junctions or known transcripts only, you can provide string tie with a file that has all the known uh, assemblies and say, okay, just follow these transcripts. Don't go and discover new ones. Follow these and find me the expression for these ones. Uh, or you can turn on the novel uh, uh, parameter and say, uh, whatever you discover, uh, I'll take it. Or you can do a mix of both. You can say, OK, here is um, uh, the, the assembly. Go find new ones, but use this as a, as a guide um, when you're trying to assess expression. Um, so string tie then passes these uh, TPM values or expression values to uh, ball gown. Ball gown uh, is responsible for uh, uh, conducting the differential analysis um, tests. So the way it does that, it simply just fits a linear model and think of the y in your linear model as the expression values for each gene. And then it will fit two models. One model with the condition that you're interested in and one model without the condition. And it will compare the fit of these two models. If they're significantly different, it means that your condition has an effect on your expression. If they're not different, then it means the condition has no effect on the expression. Um, and it does, the, it does that by looking at the f-test, takes the p-value from that comparison, and it will adjust it for multiple testing, you'll get a q-value. So for each gene, you're going to get a p-value and a q-value, and you can um, uh, set a threshold based on q-value to uh, pick any genes that are significant. Ballgown is also responsible for, uh, it will do the visualization for you. So Ballgown is just simply an R script. And will, you, I've attached a, uh, a Ballgown script for the tutorial that we're doing if we get a chance to, uh, to run it. Uh, all you need to do, you don't have to change much. All you need to change is you tell it, okay, this is the directory where my uh, expression files are and uh, just change the labels of the conditions. So the default would be like condition one, condition two. You can say uh, treatment, one, X, Y, whatever. Uh, so that's all you're changing. You're just changing the conditions and then you run the R script and it will generate all these um, plots for you and it will generate a table of the, uh, the, the most significant uh, genes with their p-values and q-values. Um, what are other options other than FPKM? Um, you can also use a raw uh, read count. So a lot of tools would uh, look at that and they don't believe in the normalization step that um, um, the string tie does. 
So you just look at the, uh, the, the raw recount and you can use uh, HTSeq uh, to uh, perform that. I mean, I, they do look at the coverage. They don't care so much about gene length because they're not comparing uh, genes uh, against each other. They're comparing the same gene across different conditions. So gene length should be constant. And you're just looking at the raw, raw counts and you're adjusting for uh, depth uh, there. Um, which one should you use, FPKM or raw counts? Because each, if you take a path, there's a, a lot of packages for each one of these different paths. So for FPKM, you have a lot of packages that you can choose. Uh, counts, you get uh, a lot of packages there. And the results might not be, well, they'll definitely not be the same. Uh, you will get some overlap, but uh, because the assumptions are different, the tests that you're running are different, you're going to get uh, different answers. So. Recommendations: If you're doing, if you're mainly uh, interested in visualization, if you're looking at heat maps, um, you're calculating full changes and stuff, you can go ahead with FPKMs. Uh, but if you're doing advanced statistical models, um, it's recommended that you go with the raw counts because uh, those uh, models are more statistically flexible. You don't have to worry about uh, uh, so many uh, so many assumptions. Um, so if differential expression, try to use the counts. Um, there are tools like dseq edge r that would take the htseq that I showed you before, htseq will do the raw counts, pass the results to dseq and edge r, and that will do your uh, differential analysis uh, for you. The output will be similar. Uh, I don't know if it's as user friendly, you're not going to get uh, those fancy plots um, with dseq and edge r, but if you're interested in just a uh, list of significant um, genes, then uh, you can use those. We're not going to be using EdgeR and DSeq uh, for this module. We're going to be focusing on strength I and ISAT. Um, one approach you can do, you can run both and uh, just look at uh, Venn diagrams, look at the overlap between the, the gene list that you generate. Um, and then if you, if, if, for example, if you want to validate and you don't have um, a lot of funding, you and you want to restrict it to a smaller subset, you can run different uh, algorithms and then take the overlap because you have more confidence and more confidence in uh, these overlapped uh, genes than uh, non-overlapped ones. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, also, multiple testing correction is extremely important considering how many tests you're conducting. Just like I mentioned, when you're doing that uh, differential analysis, you're doing that per gene. So you're taking each gene with and without the condition. Um, and depending on the gene annotation model, you're doing this test 50,000 times. Um, so by chance, you are going to find things that are significant if you're just looking at the, the p-value. So it's important that uh, you adjust by the number of tests that you're doing. Most of these tools, they do the adjustments uh, themselves. Um, and they will report Q values or just the P, P values. So make sure you look at those and that you don't look at the raw uh, P values. Um, <clears throat> so what can you do well with this data? So you have, uh, you have a lot of data now. You have expression. You have differential expression. Um, you can do some. Uh, you can do clustering with your expression uh, values. Uh, generate heat maps. Uh, you can look at classification. Uh, problems using expression uh, values, uh, or you can uh, even do pathway analysis based on the uh, genes that are differentially expressed. Uh, there are a lot of tools that you can use for, for that as well. So there's so much you can do uh, uh, past that point. Any questions? Question, yes. How to analyze RNA splicing data? What do you want to do with it? You can. So you'll get, yeah. So, so you'll get uh, you'll get a lot of files that will have the uh, the splice a list of all the splice junctions. Um, so you can uh, look at differential expression ar around the splice junctions if you want, um, or even compare the, uh, uh, the the splicing between different conditions because the um, you can do that uh, visually. I don't know if there are tools that would specifically look at the splice junctions and compare them. But like in IGV, you can definitely load uh, the slide junction of the tracks and then compare compare those as well. Yes. Um, you have the slide with the overlapping Venn diagram. Yeah. So are you uh, are you mostly doing the different approaches 
uh, the differential expression to validate them, or is it to get some uh, differentially expressed genes that aren't known by other uh, methods? Uh, I mean, either or. It depends on what you're uh, interested in. Um, Ideally, you pick a method would be the raw counts, and you stick to those uh, results. And if you can fa validate all of these, uh, then go ahead. Because even like um, looking at the overlap is not is not. Um, I'm not saying it's the right answer because you could uh, also by looking at the overlap miss some interesting things that were detected by the uh, count algorithms that were not detected by. Um, uh, the other one. So I'm just saying, if you if you're trying to really reduce that set and look at focus on the like top uh, uh, confident ones, then I would do that. And it would also actually select if you're doing validation, it would be interesting to select the over overlap, but also select things that are, that show up in some but not others, so that you can actually when you're after you do the validation, you can go back and compare and see um, how accurate these calls were.